Today, <clears throat> we'd like to talk about the value of new life. However, we, the matter of the old life hasn't been completed yet, and so we'll have to talk about the old life a bit first. And so we'll be talking some more about Patsa, sense contact. Yesterday, we talked about the matter of Patsa, contact, and Vedana, feeling. We were speaking about the 30 Ayatanika Tam, the 30 objects or matters of study which we must bring into our laboratory in order to research this matter of, of Dhamma. And so please prepare yourselves now for us to go into this in greater detail, in more subtlety. Please prepare yourselves to listen carefully. In Buddhism, we hold that the feelings are the originating cause of all problems. For this reason, it is taken to be the most important subject, these Vetana, which we can say are the original cause of all problems. And when it's like this with the Vetana, then we also must be very interested in Patsa, contact, in that contact is the originating cause of the feelings of Vetana. So if, so please examine this subject very carefully, this very important matter of the feelings which are the original cause of all our problems and patsa, which is the cause of the feelings. We need to study these feelings, the vetana, within the experience of daily life. And in that experience, we can learn about the three kinds of Vedana, pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, and neither pleasant nor unpleasant feeling. There are these three basic kinds of feelings. Please understand these things genuinely. Don't just learn their names. We need a deeper understanding of that. So examine these Vedana as their happening today in your own life. Especially examine them so you understand them in their position of being the cause of all the troublesome difficulties and hassles that arrive, arise in our lives. Whether these arise each day dozens or hundreds or thousands of times is something that you may not even know if you haven't yet examined them carefully. If we haven't been watching, then this whole matter is something which we don't know anything about. So we need to start to observe them because these vetana are what conjure up, concoct up, stir up all the different kinds of thoughts and ideas and likes and preferences, wishes, desires, aspirations, all the various actions and intentional activities of our lives are stirred up, are concocted by these different kinds of Vedana. And so we need to give them a great deal of attention. All the civilizations which have arisen in, on this planet have their origins in the feelings. The rise of each civilization is caused by the feelings and the expansion and all that, the conquering, the, the power seeking of all these various civilizations is also rooted in the Vedana. Whatever civilization it is that has arisen on this planet or anywhere in the universe, all of them are are motivated by these vetana, the feelings. All the progress and developments 
in modern science are also coming from the Vedana. The developments in nuclear things, in electronics, computers, in space exploration, and semiconductors and all these things are, are spurred on by the Vedana because of the satisfaction that various scientists and researchers have towards in the various Vedana, they, they explore, they seek, they search for these various inventions and discoveries which will supply those, those feelings. And so all the progress in going into space, the, the projects going to the moon and even further, all of these are stirred up and spurred on by the feelings. All these things, all developments in human intelligence, in human knowledge, have been encouraged and, and conditioned by the seeking of the feelings. Even the very fundamental evolution that we call bioevolution, even this is rooted in the feelings. When one level of life evolves into a higher level, this this change, this mutation, is, is stirred up by the feelings, be, by the Vedana, this feeling or awareness which leads to desire, to want. And so then the organism goes through various changes to achieve its, its wants. This is caused by the Vedana, by the feelings. All these different actions and progress within life can be traced to the Vedana and the desires caused by the Vedana. If you go back and examine all the stages of evolution of life on this planet, you can see this crucial role which the Vedana, the feelings, play. The basic principle of all this is that the feelings give rise to need or want or desire which in turn gives rise to activities. And from our actions and behavior, there come certain results which lead to further feelings. And so there are the feelings causing desires and wants which further cause action, behavior, all the different activities of our life which bring about the various results and effects which occur within our lives. This happens all in all kinds, in all situations, even in your own case, those of you who are traveling around the world in order to study and learn, this too is happening because of the feelings. All the feelings are leading, even the feelings which haven't arisen yet, those that are still in the future, nonetheless we can conceive of them, we can hope for them, we can expect them, and then this leads to desires for those feelings which haven't come yet. And that desire leads to all kinds of actions and so forth. So there are these three basic levels taking place. First there is patsa, sense contact, which causes feeling. That's the first level. And then feeling conditions want and desire. And then want and desire conditions, activities, actions, and behavior. And this is the third level. All the things we're doing, everything can be traced to the Vedana, to the feelings in this way. The feelings are the basic impulse behind all our movements and all the, the things we try to do in our lives. When we're sitting here, and we feel uncomfortable. That is the impulse that causes us to, to move, to move our body in order to change the feeling that is taking place. In this way, and in similar ways, the Vedana are the basic impulse leading to all the movements, all the desires, all the wants, all the change that occurs in our lives. Always searching, always looking to get certain kinds of feelings and avoid other kinds. In this way, all, 
all the different kinds of human awareness are are affected and influenced by the feelings even the people who believe in rebirth or reincarnation or whatever this is also caused by the feelings because of certain feelings people want to go and be reborn in certain in a certain state or condition or heaven or place or whatever in order to get the feelings they think will be there so rebirth is caused by the vetana even even wanting to be with god even wanting to go to the kingdom of god this belief is also rooted in the feelings this desire to be with god is is a desire of the feelings the want the the wanting of the feelings in order to get the certain feelings which we think are associated with the kingdom of god whatever kind of hope want aspiration goal or whatever all of them can be traced to the feelings even and so this if you can start to understand this then you will be starting to understand the fundamental principle of buddhism that says that everything originates from the vetana even the desire to die is coming from the vetana because we don't like we want to get out of or change from the current feelings then we this leads sometimes to the the desire to die or even the desire to live is caused by the want wanting the kind of feelings that we're experiencing now in this life whatever kind of want or aspiration or goal all of these things everything everything that exists can be traced to the vetana one way or another all the different sentient beings whether all the beings that have the ability to sense all of them whether on a very low level or the animal level or the human level or the so-called divine or angelic heavenly levels whatever level of sentient being it is all are have fallen under have been enslaved have are trapped within the feelings if we look at this from the negative or pessimistic view we'll say that we are the vetana are the things to which we are enslaved if we take an optimistic or positive view we'll see we'll say that the vetana are the things that motivate that push us to do all the all the things that push us to progress <coughs> and develop in life let us stress once again that all of you who have saved up your money have worked to save up money in order to travel and wander around the world this is this is motivated what will what is pushing you if you look you'll see that it's the desire for for feelings for a change of feelings you want to get some new feelings all the <coughs> others traveling can be traced to this those of you who are traveling around traveling as part of your studies even these studies are rooted in are being pushed and motivated by the feelings wanting to get some new feelings wanting to change the feelings everything is motivated by these feelings so please study them very carefully for because these vetana are actually more powerful even than god excuse us for saying so but god doesn't have near as much power and control over us as the feelings do god has these feelings have much more ability to force us to do this and that than even god does so we need to study them most carefully therefore if we want the old life then we'll continue to be slaves to the vetana however if we want new life then we need to become masters of the vetana which one do you want what what choice will you make if you're interested in new life 
then we have to learn how to be the masters of the feelings. And so we must come and study them, examine them very closely. If, if you're interested in the new life then, please join us as we examine this matter further. Don't forget now that we've all eaten that fruit that makes us know good and evil. We're all the descendants of Adam and Eve, and so we've eaten this fruit long, long ago. Remember that from eating this fruit now, we've gotten trapped under the power of good and evil. And this good and evil is really nothing but the feelings. Good feelings give rise to good and evil. Feel good and evil are just the, the wants and likes and dislikes of the feelings. Since we've eaten this fruit already, now it's time to, to vomit up this fruit which is causing us all that trouble. And so it's time to study the Vedana in order to learn, to, to find, to discover the knowledge that will enable us to vomit up that fruit. And so we come to study Buddhism with the Dhamma, which will provide us with that knowledge, which contains that knowledge. There are a few more things about the feelings which we need to, to look into. For example, when we say, talk about good and evil, that's only two, two things which isn't really enough. We, there's, in Buddhism, we don't say that there are just two kinds of feelings, just good feelings and bad feelings, but we hold that there are three. So there's both good feeling and then bad feeling, which everybody can recognize, but there's also a third kind of feeling where we, can, we can't classify it, we're unable to classify it as good or bad. Or, so we, when we do this classification, don't settle for just two categories. We, we ought to be aware of three. We can classify them as good feelings, bad feelings, and the ones where we, we can't say whether it's good or bad. We need to understand this, this third kind of feeling if we're going to have a complete understanding of the feelings. When people are classifying things as good and evil or positive and negative, that isn't enough. It doesn't, it doesn't encompass the entire situation. There's a third thing which is in the middle, which is between good and evil or positive and negative. So we need to understand this thing. When the feeling is, is good or pleasant or positive, whatever you want to call it, that draws the mind towards it, that, is, that pulls the mind, that is, attracts the mind. When the feeling is evil, bad, or negative, that repels the mind. The mind either wants to destroy that feeling or, or run away from it. But there's the third feeling which makes the mind wonder and doubt. It doesn't know whether this is good or bad. And so, instead of moving towards it, as it does with pleasant, good feelings, or moving away, running away, as with the bad feelings, it runs in circles. The mind spins around and around this feeling because it doesn't, it can't, it doesn't know what to do. We're not sure exactly what to call this third kind of feeling. We could call it unclassifiable or not yet classifiable or uncertain or whatever. But the point is to understand this, the effect or the influence it has on the mind. The, the good, pleasant feelings give rise to what we call raka or lust. The bad feelings cause tosa, anger, hatred. And then that third kind of feeling, that unclassifiable kind, gives rise to what is called moha. Moha is delusion, confusion. Raka, tosa, moha, these are the three defilements, the three things that dirty up and pollute the mind. These, these three 
impurities are caused by the different kinds of feelings. The good feelings, the happy feelings, the nice ones, condition raka, lust, or lopa, greed. That's one kind of defilement. The second kind of defilement is conditioned by the bad feelings, and that's where anger and hatred come from. And then that third kind of feeling, which we should call not yet positive or negative. This is a better way to say it than to say between positive and negative. The feeling that is not yet positive, not yet negative. This conditions the defilement of delusion, confusion, moha. All three defilements, the three kinds of defilements can be traced to the three kinds of feelings. If we don't understand, and so we should study these defilements also, because if we don't understand these three defilements, we won't understand the feelings sufficiently. We should be very careful about using the word between or in the middle. When we say the third kind of, when we said before that the third kind of feeling is between the good ones and the bad ones, that's that would lead, that's dangerous, that can lead to misunderstanding. Because usually when we say in the middle, to be in the middle or between good and evil is safe. But this third kind of feeling isn't safe, it's not really in the middle. So instead we'll use the words not yet classifiable or unclassifiable. We're not exactly sure, we're not that good at English, so we're not sure what English word to use, but we know the Pali word and we're very expert at the Pali language. The Pali word is Awahyakata, Awahyakata, which means Wayakata means <laughs> not yet classified or unable to classify. Not Wayakata, classify or describe it. <laughs> means unable to categorize, classify, so forth. So we'll use this explanation for that third, third kind of feeling. Don't think that it's in between the good and the bad because that won't be a proper way to look <coughs> at it and will lead to misunderstandings. Now we should understand, if we begin to understand these three kinds of feelings correctly, then it will be very simple to understand the defilements, the gilesa. We can understand all the things that defile and pollute the mind if we understand these three kinds of feelings. The <coughs> first kind of defilement pulls the mind, attracts the mind. The second kind of defilement is pushing away. And the third kind of defilement is running in circles. These three kinds of defilement are another thing that we need to, dis to consider and understand. And this is included in our study of the feelings. So why don't you all get together, have, have a meeting, and try and figure out what English term to use for this third kind of feeling. This kind of feeling that is not good and it's not evil, but it's not in between. Some people are using the word neutral feeling, which is to completely miss the point that that word won't do at all. We need some word to, and maybe you can help to find the word, that expresses the inability to classify this kind of feeling as good or evil. It's, it's like not being quite up to the mark. There's, to be good or evil, it has to have a certain amount of it has to be clear enough this way or that way. But when it's not quite up to that mark, then we're unable to classify it one way or the other. So please get together and find a, the correct term to use and then make this term known within academic circles, within the people who are talking about such things because to talk just in terms of positive and negative <coughs> or good and evil is, is too shallow, is too limited in understanding.
so you can all help to correct this, this limitation. The thing which we need, which we require, is not between these feelings or caught up in them, but it's above them, it's beyond them. We can say that it's ultra-mundane. To be between these feelings is still to be trapped under their influence. And so look carefully until you can realize that what human life requires and needs is to be above these feelings, beyond them, to reach a level that is, we could call, ultra-mundane. All these feelings give rise to desire. The positive good feelings give rise to the desire to be, to have, to get, to own. It, it draws in the mind, it pulls in the mind. There's an attachment that's drawing in the mind so that the mind wants to get or have or be that feeling. If it's the unpleasant, negative, bad feelings, then it, it pushes the mind away. And then the mind doesn't want to be, doesn't want to have, wants to get rid of, wants to destroy that thing. So there are these two kinds of desire. With the third kind of feeling, the one that is neither good nor bad, the kind that is unclassifiable, then the mind wants to know. It wants to know what it is. It's confused. It's, it's uncertain. And so there's an equally powerful desire, the desire to find out what it is, to, to know what it is. This is the doubt that is always troubling us. This, this kind of desire is just as powerful and dangerous as the other kinds. And so all of the feelings are giving rise to desires. This third kind of feeling can cause all kinds of problems just like the other kinds of feeling. When there is this unclassifiable, unclassifiable feeling, then there arises, there arises fear sometimes. Or we, we don't know whether we want it or don't want it, and this can cause fear. It leads to uncertainty and doubt. Uncertainty and doubt are also defilements. These disturb and trouble the mind, just like all the other defilements, such as anger and greed. When the mind is, is troubled by this defilement of uncertainty, then that is the old life. But when in the new life the mind is completely freed from, it's spotless, completely <clears throat> unsoiled by uncertainty and all the other defilements. This is the state of mind <clears throat> that we all require. And to, to achieve it, we must understand these <clears throat> feelings. Another way to look at this that will help you to understand is to take different opposing pairs and, and compare them. For example, optimistic and pessimistic. There was a very, very well-known German scholar who went around saying that Buddhism was pessimistic. This statement is, is very unfair. It's, it doesn't do justice to Buddhism at all. Buddhism is beyond both pessimism and optimism. It's neither of them, it's, nor is it between them. It's above and beyond them. Buddhism is a, a third thing, which is neither pessimistic nor optimistic. We can call it Da, da, da. or it's Buddhism instead of being one of these extremes is just like that or thusness suchness this is probably a new word for most of you and you may have trouble understanding it right off the bat but thusness is neither this nor that it's neither good nor bad it's just that it's just thus thusness or suchness this is the third kind of thing which you should understand, which you should try to understand. This thing that you maybe have never heard about, in Pali it's called tatata, tatata, or tatata. We can use either of these pronunciations. 
it means in Thai Chen Nan Eng or just thus like or just like thus like that it's not here nor there it's just like this just like that or thusness suchness it's neither pessimistic nor optimistic but is beyond both pessimism and optimism it's not caught up in any either extreme of a duality but it transcends all of the duality all of those pairs it's not trapped within any of these dualistic limitations Dakata is what Buddhism is about the person who fully realizes fully penetrates the truth the reality of Dakata is called an Arahant one who has completely gone beyond all defilement one who is completely free of all defilement another word for this is a perfect <coughs> perfectly enlightened being or a perfected human being this is the arahant the one who has fully realized the state of thusness the condition of being just thus this is what buddhism is about there's one more thing we'd like you to know and that's this point is that when we come to study to examine very profound dhamma the real deep and subtle truth we don't have the language to express it when we want to come to talking about these this dhamma this very profound thing all the normal vocabularies that people are using don't have words for these things because ordinary people aren't interested in profound truth so in all the vocabularies and languages that people are using we don't have the words to talk about this thing tatata tatata is the most profound truth but we don't know how to express it when we say in thai chen nan eng chen means like nan is that eng is just or merely so we could say that datata means just like that but this isn't right because we're using that and that is the opposite of this and datata is neither this nor that it's neither in nor out here nor there datata has nothing to do with any duality it has nothing to do with this or that so we but we don't know what words to use we're we're trapped because language doesn't have the ability to express such a profound thing as da ta ta so we say just like that maybe we can try the word thus thus is neither this nor that but don't put it between this or that put it above transcending beyond above completely unrelated to and separate from this and that if you can understand thus in the proper way maybe we can try this word but it's still just just words so we're we're always trapped this way tata ta is is the heart of buddhism if we to understand these feelings is we need to 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 penetrate to the reality of tata ta but this tata ta is not this or that it's not in or out it's not up or down above or below it has nothing to do with any of these dualisms with any extreme position as soon as we think it's this <coughs> or that we haven't seen da ta ta if we think i do something or someone else does it to me this is wrong and this is not realizing da ta ta to think that something is good or bad is to overlook Da ta ta. Da ta ta has nothing to do with this or that, in or out, up or down, good or bad, me or you. Da ta ta is just thus, the state that is purely thus or such, completely above, beyond all duality. This is the heart of Buddhism, but we're <laughs> always we're stuck. We don't quite know what words to use. But if we can understand this reality. of da ta ta of thusness 
of suchness, then we can get to the bottom <coughs> of the feelings. However, there's maybe one word that can help us here. Tatata, what we're talking about, is neither positive or negative. It has nothing to do with all the dualities. We've got one word that can help us to, to understand what we mean here. And that word is sunyata, sunyata. Sunyata means void, void or voidness. This word can help us to understand if we can understand what, what voidness means. Unfortunately now, most people take void to be a negative or pessimistic thing. They get carried away and jump on this word right away and start judging it as pessimistic. But void has nothing to do with optimism or pessimism, good nor bad, negative or positive. It's neither this nor that. It's void, completely void and empty of all these dualities. Com it, it has no dimension. Sunyata has no dimension. So it cannot be this or that, in or out, up or down. It's completely dimensionless. It's void. It's void. So this word sunyata, if we under if we try to understand it with an open mind, can can help us to understand. If we can keep ourselves directed towards the ultimate goal of of human life, then we, we will realize void or sunyata. But it's very, very difficult to convince people that this is what we need, that this is what we require. It's very, very difficult to get people interested in sunyata, especially children. Children, they're not interested in void. They want things that are happy and nice and fun and all that. Even adults are not very interested in sunyata. All they want are the positive, the good, and all that. But sunyata is what we really need. It's it's above or beyond all that negative and positive, the good and bad, the up and the down, the wrong and the right, all those dualisms, all those pairs that are keeping us trapped and, and in suffering. The, all the feelings, the Vedana, are, are drawing, drawing us into these conditions of good and bad whether it's the happy feelings or the unhappy feelings or those uncertain, unclassifiable feelings. They're always pulling us into duality, getting us confused and caught up in and thereby tormented by duality. And so the goal of life is to transcend all that, to be above it, beyond it, free of it, to be void of all that duality. This is sunyata. This is the goal of, of our lives. If we can realize, if we can understand and realize this goal, then we will be able to completely control all the feelings. When we are, when the mind is void of all that, the, the feelings have no power and influence over that mind. All of you now who are world travelers, students traveling around the world. What are you looking for? Are you looking for voidness or for utmost positivism? Are you looking for the highest kind of the positive, of the highest good, the supreme good? Or are you looking for voidness? What is it you want? What is the object of all your, your travels and searches? And can you see the difference between these, between these two things? If what we're, what we're after is void, voidness, then we'll be looking for something that is neither utmost positiveness or negative in any way. Something that is neither right nor wrong, good nor bad, desirable or undesirable. All these likable, unlikable, and all these dualistic things. Voidness is not not trapped within any of that. If we use the word da ta da, which includes just like that, then we're still limited by this word that. 
because it's neither that nor this. It's neither this or other. It's not other than that or other than this. It's just you can't you can't use any of these words. It's very difficult. But if if we can realize what we mean by sunyata, sunyata, voidness, void of all those all those dualisms, this is the supreme freedom. This is the the highest, the most perfect independence is sunyata. If we can understand and realize, penetrate to this feeling of sunyata, the feeling of sunyata, then all the other kinds of feelings, the fe- the positive, negative, and, and who knows what kind of feelings will not be a problem anymore. Freedom and independence are within voidness. When we understand this freedom of voidness, then we can understand Nibbana, the goal of Buddhist practice. But now we're all stuck. We're all stuck on positivism. So when we hear da ta da, we attach to that. Or then when we hear not that, then we attach to other. And we hear not other and we attach to this because we're, we're so stuck in, in positivism. But if we, with sunyata, sunyata is neither this nor that, neither self nor other, up nor down, right or left, good or bad, right or wrong, positive or negative. Sunyata is nothing dualistic. <coughs> sunyata is free, it's void, it's independent. This is the, the highest, the highest state that the mind can realize. This sunyata, this freedom, this independence, if when it's perfect, when there's no attaching to this or that, positive or negative or any of that, then the mind is void and then the mind is realizes Nibbana. Nibbana is the, the ultimate goal of Dhamma in Buddhism. The Buddha said that Nibbanang Paramang Sunyang, Nibbana is the supreme void. Nibbana is the utmost voidness. This is the ultimate goal of the study and practice of Dhamma within Buddhism. You need to be very careful that you don't confuse voidness with nihilism. Some people say that this teaching is nihilistic, which is a completely wrong understanding. Voidness has nothing to do with nihilism, but because, because when, although something, things are void, there are still things there, there is still something taking place. It's not nothingness, it's not emptiness, which are some of the wrong interpretations of sunyata. Sunyata is not nihilism, it's not nothingness. It's not saying that n- there's nothing there, that there's just a vacuum or complete emptiness. Voidness means that there are things. There are things that need to be done. There are relationships, there are interactions, connections. There's all these things, but it's void. It's void of good and bad, right and wrong, up and down, left and right, this and that, in and out. But there are still things there. It has nothing to do with nothingness. It doesn't have anything to do with emptiness. So please don't misunderstand sunyata, as some have done. It has nothing to do with with nihilism at all. Now that we understand voidness, sunyata, let's go back and take another look at the feelings. These feelings, when they arise, are void. They're neither I nor mind, self nor soul. They're not atta or auto or atman or spirit or self or any of those things. They're not individual or personal. They're just feelings. They're not I or mine. But, un- but excuse us for saying so, but we're all ignorant. We're very foolish, sometimes even stupid, and we don't understand things correctly. So when there is contact, patsa, in, in the place, in the presence, <coughs> if there is ignorance at contact, 
then there will be ignorant feeling. And then we get caught up in the positiveness or negativeness or the uncertain, whether it's positive or negative. And then that, that quality leads to a desire, desire for more, a desire to get rid of, a desire to, to know. And that desire leads to attachment. The mind follows through on this tendency of the ignorant feelings, gets caught up in the feelings, becomes trapped with all that. And this leads to attachment. And these we take things to be I and mine. We attach to them, we regard them as I and mine. And when this happens, patsa feelings and all these desires become heavy burdens. When attachment, when the egoistic attitude towards things arises, all these things become heavy burdens upon the mind. And this weighs down life and makes it heavy. When we realize this, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to get rid of these burdens? How, can, how are we going to drop them? The answer is in not being ignorant about the feelings anymore to see them as they are, as void, to see the voidness of the feelings instead of clinging to them as I and mine, as positive and negative or unclassifiable, but we still want to try and classify them. If we see the feelings as void, then that ignorance won't take place and life won't become a burden. If, if we're tired of carrying this heavy weight around with us, this is how to to let it go. The difficulty, the problem, the trouble with all this is that at the moment of contact we're ignorant and so there arises, there is ignorant contact, ignorant feeling which leads to foolish desires and, and all the stupidity of that. This happens, why, the reason this happens is because there is no wisdom. When there's no wisdom at contact then the feelings are not wise and the wanting is not wise. And if the wanting isn't wise, it, it, it becomes defiled under the influence of positivism and negativism. So what, are, what can we do about this? What we have to do is train, develop the correct wisdom to be there at the moment of patsa. And then there will be wise patsa, wise contact, wise feelings, and wise want. The reason we lack the wisdom, the wisdom we need at contact, is because we haven't studied this matter. Ignorant means not knowing. We don't understand this because we've never taken the time to study it properly. And so we lack this knowledge and wisdom that we need to manage the situation. And so we have to then turn to studying these things properly. We need what is called meditation, or we prefer mental development. If we develop the mind correctly through using the power of concentration, then it is possible to develop the necessary wisdom that needs to be there at the moment of contact. So through correct Buddhist meditation, there will arise the wisdom that allows us to govern the contact so that only wise feelings and wise want arises. But the reason, another part of the problem is that even if there is some wisdom, we often the wisdom isn't there where it's needed. It isn't, it's not right there at the moment of contact. It's too late. It misses the mark. And this is because Sati, sati, mindfulness, is, is missing. And so if we, this is why we practice mindfulness of breathing. If we practice mindfulness of breathing as the Buddha taught, then sati, mindfulness, will be quick enough, fast enough, agile enough, expert enough to transport wisdom to the contact. So through mental development, we train wisdom and mindfulness. And then there's enough wisdom and mindfulness is quick enough to bring wisdom right there at the moment of contact. And that will prevent, and then there's no ignorance. 
If there's no wisdom, then there must be ignorance. But if there is enough wisdom on time, then the contact will be wise and it won't get caught up in positivism, in negativism. It won't become a basis for attachment. So there are at least four things then that we, we need to have. We've already mentioned sati, mindfulness, and, and wisdom, panya. These are two, but there are two others that make up a set of four things that are needed to make sure that patsa never turns into any problems or hassles. So first there must be sati, mindfulness, to transport wisdom to the contact. And then that wisdom becomes attentiveness that oversees, that guards over the situation and doesn't allow anything to go wrong. And then samadhi, the, the, power, the power and energy of a mind that has been collected and, and focused. This, these four factors, mindfulness, wisdom, attentiveness, and concentration, work together to oversee, to guard over the contact, and then the feelings, and then the, the wanting that arises from the feelings. And all of these will be correct. They won't fall under the influence of good and evil or, or uncertainty of whether it's good or evil. Those problems won't occur. The mind can re remain void and free. And so patsa will not turn into suffering and the old life will not, will not trouble us anymore. We'll do this in a very easy way so that it's a very simple way so that it's easy to remember. It's like we have four friends. There are four people who are our very, very best friends. The first friend is mindfulness. The second friend is intuitive wisdom, panya. The third friend is attentiveness, sampajanya. And the fourth friend is concentration, samati. These are our four best friends. Sati, panya, sampajanya, samadhi, or mindfulness, wisdom, attentiveness, and concentration. Whenever any situation arises, and by this we mean the, the very moment of contact, it's a very specific moment, at that moment of contact, when it arises then our friend mindfulness runs and gets our second friend, wisdom. Mindfulness runs and gets wisdom and brings wisdom here. And then once wisdom gets to the contact, wisdom changes, transforms into attentiveness. And attentiveness guards over, watches over, oversees the contact. If attentive, attentiveness doesn't have enough strength and power, then the fourth friend, concentration, helps, gives enough power and energy to, to do the work that needs to be done. So when these four best friends of ours, mindfulness, wisdom, attentiveness, and concentration, come together and help us like this, there's no way that patsa can be a problem because our four friends are watching over it and taking care of this situation for us. So we need to have these four, these four friends. Without these four friends, we'll be lost. But with these four friends, patsa, will never be a problem for us again. So we have to try our best <clears throat> to have these four friends. We have to put forth great effort to do what it is necessary, necessary to obtain these four friends. And then these four friends must train themselves, must be exquisitely trained and in shape in order to deal with, in order to manage patsa, that sense contact, the seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and all the mental things. When these four friends are expert in doing their jobs and performing their functions, then patsa is no problem. As soon as some a contact occurs, sati, the first friend, mindfulness, brings wisdom, the second friend. And then wisdom, wisdom just the friend that is called wisdom just drives, aw <clears throat> drives away any value 
that feeling might have. It's once there is sense contact, there must arise feeling. Feeling will automatically arise in response to, to contact. But the value of that feeling, positive or negative or the uncertain kind, that is just driven away. Our friend wisdom just says, get out of here, leave us alone, don't bother us. And this thing then can't stir up into all the problems of good and evil or we're not certain whether it's good or evil. This friend we call wisdom, intuitive wisdom, ultimate wisdom, has the mantra, suchness, thusness, voidness, get out of here, leave us alone, and then there's no problem. In this way, Hatsa is kept from being ignorant, and the feelings don't, don't have this, this diluted value of positive or negative or un, undistinguishable. And then that can't get concocted up into all the foolish desires and attachments and suffering. And it, when it's like this, then, those feelings when the value of those feelings is driven away, then there's just feeling, and the feeling is, is free, it's independent. And this is the kind of feeling that a human being needs, the feelings that are free. With adequately <coughs> trained, when these our four friends are expert, then the result will be that feeling is, is free, it's independent, it's, it's void. In some sects of Mahayana, in some of the Mahayana sects, they have a mantra. They utter the mantra, they, they utter the words suchness, voidness, or only such, only void. They, they use this mantra to drive away, to, to drive off, <coughs> to chase away the value of the feelings. In this way, the feelings are intelligent, are wise, and when, when the feelings are intelligent, then the mind is intelligent. When the feelings are ignorant, then the mind is ignorant as well. But when that ignorance is dispelled, is gotten rid of, then the mind is not, is not ignorant. And so, by using this mantra, thusness, suchness, voidness, right at the moment of contact, the feelings are free. They're free of positive, negative, and who knows what, un that unable to distinguish one. And then they don't lead into all the problems we've been talking about. So you would all do well to, to practice, to become very proficient in this mantra, thusness, suchness, voidness, thusness, suchness, voidness. Say it over and over again until you're so skillful and fluent with this mantra that at every contact this mantra arises automatically and drives away any value, value that Vedana might have. And then those feelings are, are wise and intelligent. The mind remains wise and free. This friend of ours, Wisdom, comes and says thusness, voidness, voidness, suchness. It, every time it comes, it, it brings these words and, and keeps Vetana from being ignorant. Whenever there's the experience, then, mindfulness brings our friend wisdom. And then wisdom prevents the feelings from being ignorant. We have, without wisdom, we have the, the tendency to turn feelings into good and bad and, and who knows what, positive and negative likable and dislikable, um, lovable and hateful and all that. But when there is wisdom there, wisdom just says thusness, suchness, voidness, and doesn't pro give any opportunity for foolish feeling to occur. And then when the foolish feeling doesn't happen, then there isn't <coughs> foolish want. This foolish want, when there's no foolish want, then there's, there's no desire. Or in Pali we use the word danha, Danha, I prefer the word craving. Craving is always foolish and ignorant. It's, it's blind desire, blind want. And so when there's 
no foolish desire there's there's none of this craving and then craving doesn't drag the mind along after <clears throat> after that desire and get into all kinds of of trouble so when wisdom our friend panya comes in and says suchness voidness there's no opportunity for the for the value of positivism and negativism and uncertainty to arise and then there's no danha whenever there's foolish feeling then there arises danha in in some form or another wanting to get wanting to get rid of or or running around in circles in confusion but through wisdom there's no danha instead there can be wise feeling and then wise want there's a very important distinction which many people fail to realize between <clears throat> craving blind desire and wise want when want is wise it's not selfish it's just wanting what is we need wanting to be free of the defilements wanting to be free of foolish want wanting to end suffering this is wise want and it doesn't cause any problems but when wanting is foolish is ignorant is blind <clears throat> then we call it craving and that leads to attachment and drags the mind into all kinds of suffering so we need to do what is necessary to have wisdom at the moment of experience of sense contact but nowadays we don't have any mindfulness we don't have any wisdom we don't have any attentiveness and we don't have any concentration so contact is foolish the feelings are stupid and there's all kind of blind craving and desire and the result is we suffer so let's let's <clears throat> train ourselves train these four friends so that there will be wisdom strong enough quick enough right there where it's needed to keep everything wise and clean and pure and cool when we have these four best friends that a human being can have when we have these four very best friends that are strong enough quick enough proficient enough fast enough expert enough then patsa then we can control we can regulate we can manage patsa and then we can manage the feelings and then when we can manage the feelings when we can control the feelings we can manage everything earlier we said that everything has its source its origin in the feelings everything with with no exception all the things that happen in our lives these are grounded are rooted in the feelings when we can manage when we can control these feelings then we can control everything and nothing will be a problem for us excuse us when we when we speak directly like we've been doing don't please don't take it as an insult or as we're we're putting you as if we're putting you down but we're when we say that because we want to tell you that if we can regulate control the feelings then we can control god god is able to make all kinds of things happen that we don't want but when we can manage the feelings we can manage everything and then we can manage god god won't be able to cause anything that that we don't that we don't want this is possible we can when we can manage the feelings so please find please find these four best friends that a human being can have in order that you can control the feelings and control everything even god please understand these words that we've just said very very carefully don't don't allow yourself to misunderstand them be very careful to understand what we mean when we say that when we can manage the feelings we can manage everything even god when we can control regulate the feelings we can regulate everything including god when we say this we mean that we can control the personal god all of us all, the only god we know is this personal anthropomorphic kind of god that creates things and and destroys things this god that we all have is itself 
is nothing but the feelings. It's the feelings that creates everything. It's the feelings that destroy everything. This is the meaning that you need to, to grasp when we say that by controlling the feelings we can control everything. We're not talking about the impersonal God, but we're saying that that impersonal God, which is all that anybody knows, that that is nothing but the feelings. So by controlling the feelings, we can, can control this God. When we talk like this, it may sound as if we're just making fun or just teasing or maybe that we're being ignorant. But in reality, this is a very profound fact and we're doing our best to make it, it clear to you. By controlling the feelings, we can control even God. We're not speaking in, any, in an arrogant way at all. This God that you know is merely the influence of the feelings. The God that everyone is talking about is nothing but the power of the Vedana to make us do this and do that. That's all that people mean when they say God. And so when we say we can control this God, we're just saying we can control the feelings. There's nothing arrogant about this statement at all. It's a fact which you can realize for yourself. Please do what you need to do to realize this important truth. When there's no wisdom at contact, then the feelings are ignorant. And the ignorant feelings stir up ignorant want, desire, craving, blind, blind want. And this is God. God, this ignorant want, leads to all the actions and behavior that we do. It's what <clears throat> ignorant want, craving, forces us to do all these these things. And so that that desire, that craving, is the meaning of God. God is what makes us, that forces us, makes us to do things. That is God. When we can control feeling, that it, then we can control God, because by keeping the feelings wise, then there is no craving or blind want to force us to do this and that to chase after things, to run away, and so forth. When we can control the feelings, then there is instead what we can call right aspiration. When the feelings are wise, then they lead to wise or right, right aspiration. This is completely different than foolish want, blind want, ignorant want, and all that. Right aspiration is to know what needs to be done and just to do what needs to be done. And there's no foolishness or blindness involved in that. So this is how we can control God, that God of danha, of craving, that makes us do this and that. We can control it by being wise at the feelings. And then there will be only wise aspiration. If we can do this, if we have studied and understood the Vedana, the feelings, sufficiently on this very profound level, then we will be able to practice in this way, and then we will receive the, the benefit, the fruit, the advantage of having only right <coughs> aspiration and not being under the control of blind craving. We have to be very careful about this word want because there are two very, very different kinds of want. On one hand, there is the blind, ignorant want of, that we call craving, danha, but there can also be wise want, want that is right aspiration. These two kinds of want are more different than black and white. And so be very careful to, to notice the difference. When there is ignorant <coughs> feeling, we get, the mind gets caught up in the values of those ignorant feelings and there arises blind want. And then that, that ignorant God goes berserk trying to make us do all kinds of things which we really don't need to do because they, they always bring us suffering. But when it's wise feeling, when there's wisdom, when these four very good friends are there to make sure that there's wisdom at the moment of contact, Wise feeling 
is no longer caught up in positive and negative. The mind doesn't get trapped in that. And so we can control the feelings and control that want, that, that craving. And so instead of blind want, we have wise want, right aspiration. Right aspiration is something that we ought to have. We ought to have it, maintain it, and use it. Because if we can use, if we have and use right aspiration, then we will do the things that are necessary within our lives and there won't be any suffering. So we should be very interested in this point, in, in having right aspiration rather than blind want. Then we will have the correct God. Instead of having some insane, ignorant God that causes us problems, with right aspiration, we have a wise and benevolent God, a wise God that does not force us into suffering. So learn the distinction. You ought to be very interested in this distinction between right want and, and foolish want. Now we'd like to look back over the succession of events that make up the old life. It all, the old life begins with old patsa or ignorant patsa. When we're ignorant at sense contact, whether it's the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind, then there arises ignorant feeling. And the mind getting caught up in the values of ignorant feelings leads to blind want. Blind one is desiring all kinds of, of unhealthy, crazy things which will get us into more and more trouble. Once there is danha, craving, blind one, ignorant want, it starts to solidify or if it, if it hangs around enough, it, if it coagulates enough, then it, it becomes what we call upadana, attachment. This is when the the feeling of desire turns into the, the concept I desire or the desirer, the wanter, the craver. First there's just wanting, desiring, craving, but then this develops into the concept that if there's craving there must be a craver, if there's want there must be a wanter, a desirer. And so that ignorant, that ignorant want becomes the ignorant, foolish concept of wanter, desirer, craver. And this then is, this is what we call upadana or attachment. This may not sound logical to some of you. Some people think that to, to want, there has to be someone who wants first. Some people's logic says that you have to have the I who craves, the craver, before you can have craving. This is how some people think. But we don't take logic as our standard, we take experience, reality as our standard. And if we examine the truth of the situation, we'll see that in reality, want, ignorant want, craving comes first. Then the concept, the, 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 the thought that there must be a craver, a wanter. Once there is this craver or wanter, this concept, then the, it's, this develops further. The mind is, goes further astray, gets more caught up in this, this ignorant delusion. And it's the, the ego, the, the I, is, is growing or the, the self begins to exist. In Pali, we call this bawa, bawa, or in the Thai pronunciation, pawa, pawa, is this this ignorant illusion of of self. Now, for many of us, we still believe in this this self, but if we have been understanding how the, the ignorant feelings turn into the ignorant desires into the ignorant craver. We see that this is all a series of illusions, of mistaken identities. And so when, this, when the self begins to exist, this is just a further misconception, a misunderstanding. But it's, it's what's going through the mind, and we take it to be real, 
because we haven't compared what's in our the, the thought in the mind with the reality of what's taking place. Once the self exists, then that self, it's, it's ready to, to enter the playing field, to, to run out onto the field. And then as, when it's ready, it's, it's on deck, like a baseball player, and then it's born. It comes up to the bat, to bat, it goes out onto the field and gets beat up in some nasty football game and gets caught up in all kinds of suffering. This is what happens. This is how the old life works. This series of events, ignorant contact, ignorant feeling, ignorant desire, attachment, existence, and then the birth of the self. Not the birth of the body, the birth of the, the ego within the mind. And then it runs out on the playing field. It's, as it is born, it runs out on the playing field and gets caught up in all that chaos. And, and, and suffering. This is, this is how it works. You can, you can see the, the progression of events as the mind gets further lost in this illusion. You can see how that, that ignorant, there's that ignorant craving, that ignorant desire. This is, this is like, this is like breeding or mating between, between two animals, that ignorant desire, the desire, that sexual desire. And then this leads to the, the thought of the, the craver, the concept of the desirer. This is like conception when the, the sperm and the, the ovum, fertil, when the sperm fertilizes the ovum, then you have conception. And then the, the fertilized egg just states and existence pawa pawa which comes out of that attachment pawa is like gestation the embryo is growing in the womb and then as this embryo grows in the womb it's full born it's full grown or it's it's fully developed to be born onto the playing field of life this is all happening in the mind it's the the self is developing, it's the self that is born. And it all began with ignorant, ignorant contact leading to ignorant feeling. This is what the old life is like. If we've seen the suffering involved in this old life and we'd like to be free of it, then we have to understand this succession of events that gives rise to the birth of, of the ego, of the, the great I am. If we can understand this, then we'll have the knowledge we need to get free of that old life. So when it's the old life, there's ignorant feeling, ignorant want, ignorant attachment. Attachment is always ignorant. And then existence and birth. The ego is born. There's the, the I, egoism, selfishness is born. And this always leads to suffering, to dukkha. But in the new life, it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. There's feeling is kept under control. Feeling remains wise. And so feeling only leads to wise aspiration. And wise aspiration doesn't turn into attachment. Wise aspiration, it just stops there. It stops with wise feeling and wise aspiration. That's enough. We don't need any more than that. We don't need the attachment. We don't need that egoism and selfishness and the birth of the ego where it runs out on the playing field to get beat up. We don't need any of that. It just stops there at, at wise feeling and wise aspiration. This is the new life. When there's sufficient knowledge to control vetana, to, to oversee the, the contact, the sense experience, then the feelings don't don't get lost in the values of positive, negative, and uncertainty. And then it's, it's free. In the old life, there's, it's ignorant feeling is always leading to the birth of the ego, to the birth of the self, to I, to me, to mine, and all of that. And, and every time that this egoistic birth takes place, there will be suffering. We don't, it can happen tens, hundreds, thousands of times in a day. 
And every time it happens, it's suffering. That's the old life, the old life of ego birth, of, of pain, of sorrow, of suffering. But in the new life, it's, it just stops with wise feeling and wise aspiration and there's no, there's no ego. Ego, self, and all that illusion isn't conjured up, isn't stirred up. There's no ego birth, there's no selfishness. There's none of these crazy thoughts about I and me and mine and all the selfishness that comes from that. And so that life is free. It's, it's peaceful. It's wise. There's no, there's no problems. The old life is always leading to ego and to suffering. But the new life, because of wisdom, is, is free. It's, it's calm, it's peaceful, and it's cool. It's free of all that birth. The, the old life, when there's all that, that birth, it becomes, when there's birth, there's anything that is born has to get old, it gets sick, and it eventually dies. But in the new life, there's no birth, so there's no getting old, there's no getting sick, and there's no death. The new life is free of birth, aging, illness, and death. The old life is, is trapped within these worldly conditions, but the new life is free of all that. This is the meaning of Nibbana, the supreme thing, the, the highest goal in Buddhism. In the new life, we can realize Nibbana, there is, and there is total freedom from birth, aging, illness, and death. We hope that you are interested in this, in this new life that is not trapped under birth, aging, illness, and death and all the suffering that they bring. Physical birth, the birth of these bodies out of the wombs of our mothers is, is no big deal. It happens once in a lifetime, and so it in itself is no problem. Being born physically is no problem. It's just an event that happens to all of us. But there's another kind of birth, which is the birth we've been talking about. This is spiritual birth. When we talk about spiritual birth, we mean the, the birth of the ego, the self, of the concepts, the thoughts of I am, of egoism, self-centeredness, of selfishness. This birth of the I, the ego, the self, the soul, it, within the mind, is what we mean by spiritual birth. It has nothing to do with the body. It's a birth in the mind. It happens over and over again throughout our lives, many, many times, hundreds, thousands of times each day. This is the spiritual birth that is stirred up by the ignorant feelings and ignorant desire and attachment. This is the spiritual birth that always leads to dukkha, to suffering. Whenever there's some ignorant wants in this direction or that, wanting for this and that, then it leads to being born in some form or another, born in some condition or state or another, being born as this is that, as him as her, being born in all kinds of different ways. And whatever the kind of birth, whether it's animal or human or celestial, whatever, whatever the kind of birth, and you're going through many of them in each day as the mind keeps changing and under the influence of the feelings, whatever the birth, it will always bring suffering, it will always bring pain, conflict, unsatisfaction, discontent, friction in one form or another. That's the old life, the old life that is, is trapped within that, that spiritual birth. But the, in the new life, the new life, there is none of this birth. There is no I and mind and ego and self and soul taking place in the mind, and so the mind is free. This is the mind that, that realizes Nibbana, Nibbana, the, the utmost voidness, Nibbana, coolness, perfect freedom. This is something that we won't have time to go into today. We'll save it for a, a later lecture. We'll save the discussion of Nibbana because it's for another time since it's such a very important issue. Or, or thing to talk about. But the point to know now is that by studying and controlling the Vedana, spiritual birth won't take place 
and then there won't be any suffering. And then we have this thing we call the new life, the new life that is free of birth, aging, illness, and death. Birth, aging, illness, and death as physical processes are, are not important. They're just natural things. But birth, aging, illness, and death in the, uh, the mind, the deluded mind that is attaching to these things as, <clears throat> as I and mine, that brings great suffering. Physical death is no problem, but the attaching to death as I and mine brings great suffering. So we have, to, we have to get to know all these things. And so in order to control the Vedana, we must know ourselves. We have to study ourselves. It's, it's kind of funny. You need to study yourself, but there's no self. Try, you'll have to figure this one out too. You, you yourself must study and practice the Dhamma. But that self that has to study and practice is not a self. Can you, can you understand the meaning of this? The self that is not a self must study and practice the Dhamma. You have to know what our life is, where it comes from, where it's going, what this process of life is, what, what makes it up. We've been talking about these things in order to help you to know yourself, to understand yourself, in order to have sufficient wisdom to keep the feelings under control, to prevent attachment in spiritual birth and all that, that suffering. This, this self-knowledge, <clears throat> this self-understanding is not something that you can get from books. And listening to a lecture like this will not do it either. Just reading and listening or even just thinking logically will not bring you the knowledge of yourself that you need. This self-knowledge must be found by studying our own lives, by being very aware and mindful of the process and events of our own life. And in only in this way, not by listening, not by reading, but only by studying our own lives, the reality of them, can we have the true self-knowledge that is genuine wisdom, which can keep the feelings under control so they don't get caught within the, the power of the positivism, negativism. So we can see it all as just, just thus, as, as voidness. And then the mind is free and realizes Nibbana, the highest fruit, the highest benefit that life can bring. The, the only thing that is really worth having the only thing that's really worth aspiring toward is this Nibbana. So we request that you allow us to, to end the lecture at this point and we'll save the discussion of Nibbana for another time. <clears throat>